because of the security measures in place, there was no way to easily open the front doors to the club. Instead, officers called in help from the local fire department. They used a steel bar to force open the doors and let themselves inside. The view they were met with was one full of red spatter down the hallway, droplets of blood pooling and partially drying, and further into the main rooms of the club, piles of bodies. The sight was like nothing they'd ever seen before. Over a dozen victims all hogtied with their wrists and ankles tied behind them. This is Red Rum. Stories about the true victims of crime. The Chinatown Massacre. Willie Mack was a well-known 22-year-old man who had moved with his family years earlier from mainland China in 1975 to the US. The family had moved from a small, overcrowded apartment building in the Kwangtung province to Seattle, They immersed themselves in American life, and Willie had attended Sharples Junior High School, one of the only schools nearby teaching Mandarin as a foreign language at the time. Willie didn't speak much English, but he was very keen to learn. After a few years there, he moved on to Cleveland High School, where things had started to shift for him. He was becoming restless, and realised that he could have more fun and potentially start earning money if he skipped school. He began getting into more and more trouble and eventually dropped out of high school, earning his GED at a nearby college. Willie didn't care much for his education by this point. He just wanted to make money. And by the early 1980s, he had discovered how seemingly lucrative gambling could be. By this point, Willie was gambling most nights and often would make up to $100 a night, equivalent to around $350 in today's money. Since dropping out of school, he had found that his friendship group had shifted. He had managed to get a number of jobs over the last few months, working at affluent Seattle restaurants. And whilst there, he met a number of other young people, some a little older, most of whom had much more experience of crime, something he was very interested in by now. It wasn't long before he found his way into the hip Sing Tong, one of the most well-respected and feared Tongs of the time. A Tong is a Chinese association or secret society, and in this case, Willie was interested in the Hop Sing Tong because of its association with organised crime. Willie had spent the last few years getting into a considerable amount of debt, and in 1981, he brought his friend along to a grocery store in Seattle, where they robbed around $2,000, which is just over $7,000 today. Even that huge amount of money didn't help out much at the time because of the amount of debt that he owed, and by 1983, He was still in severe debt with a number of gambling clubs that he worked at. By this point, he owed over $30,000, which in today's money would be $106,000. Gambling problems weren't uncommon in the early 1980s in Seattle. Betting money was the norm. Instead of going out for a cup of coffee, you'd go to a gambling club. That amount of debt weighed heavily on Willie, and he spent his evenings complaining to his friends, confused about how he'd gotten into this mess, and planning, at this point only in his mind, on one day robbing the gambling clubs that he thought had robbed him of all of his money. That thought quickly progressed to Willie floating the idea around his friends, and then he started to properly work on a plan. He knew he couldn't do it alone, so he sought out a team to help him, and he brought two of his friends on board. One of those friends was a man called Benjamin Ng, a criminal with a history of gun crime and an avid gambler. It didn't take much to get Benjamin on board, given his extensive experience of losing at gambling clubs. Benjamin was just 20 years old, he stood at just over 5 foot, and was skinny. He had dropped out of high school after a series of incidents 
where he then progressed to carrying a gun wherever he went. One of the reasons Willie took such a shining to Benjamin was that both of their parents were from the Kwangtung province of mainland China. And then they had moved to Hong Kong before moving to the US in 1975. Benjamin's family were hardworking and hadn't been involved in crime at all. But Benjamin was arrested a number of times and it wasn't long before his parents told him he couldn't come home. Both Willie and Benjamin went to the same high school in Seattle and then they both worked in Chin's Palace restaurant as cooks. The pair operated similarly and they both had a tendency towards crime. A few years before Willie approached him to come on board with the heist, Benjamin had been involved in an argument with four young men where he ended up shooting at them. He did injure all four of the men, but they escaped by running away. The second of Willie's friends was a man who went by the name Tony Ng. Tony was unlike Benjamin and Willie in that he didn't have a criminal record. He was born in Hong Kong and had come over to the US in 1960 with his father. The pair lived in the US for 10 years before the rest of his family, his mother, grandmother, two brothers and sister, joined them. They relocated from Baltimore to Seattle and Tony earned $150 a week, around $550 in today's money. It wasn't unusual for Tony to spend his evenings at local gambling clubs with friends. Tony was an anomaly in the group of three. He had attended college and didn't have a temper. He was reasonable and soft-spoken and worked hard. But when he was approached by Willie, Tony quickly agreed to help because he was in desperate need of money. Like Willie, Tony had gambled more than he had and he actually owed Willie over $1,000. He knew that doing this robbery would clear his debt and he'd be free to continue building her life with his girlfriend, not worrying about owing dangerous people money. Willie would organise planning meetings at his local hangout spot, the Denny's restaurant in South Seattle. He was a great speaker and he would rile the others up, especially Benjamin. He'd focus on his frustrations and anger towards the gambling clubs. It wasn't long before he got both Benjamin and Tony excited about the plan. A heist that was so ambitious, it needed serious consideration and time. A heist in a gambling club made complete sense. In the years prior, Willie had heard of a number of robberies that had happened at gambling clubs that simply went unreported. Reporting robberies at such clubs came along with the threat of the club being completely shut down. This was the plan with the least risk. Willie told his accomplices that they would be robbing the most well-known and richest gambling club in Chinatown. The Wa Mei Club was known for its high-stakes gambling, its most popular game being Pai Gao, a game with 32 Chinese dominoes. It's played in major casinos in China, the US, Canada, Australia and New Zealand. The house bank was around $100,000 at any one time, and as much as $50,000 could be on the table. On top of that, Willie told Benjamin and Tony that they would rob the club on a Saturday night. The club itself was open for business on Thursday, Friday and Saturday and would stay open all the way up until 6am. Willie told the other two that evenings were good for business anyway, but Saturdays were better. That's when the local restaurant owners would come to the club with their weekly earnings in their pockets. And the Saturday in question was also Chinese New Year. That meant that many businesses would be closed for the holiday and Wa Mei would be populated with people celebrating. That area of Chinatown was populated with a number of gambling clubs, but on that Saturday, and in fact the entire week, the other major club on that street had been closed for construction, which meant that even more customers would be coming through the doors of the Wa Mei. Willie made it crystal clear that he wasn't afraid of getting his hands dirty, and he envisioned there would be violence. Quote, If the people with me robbing these people won't shoot them, I'll shoot them all. He had also chosen the Wame Club because it was an exclusive club, catering to members only and bringing in some of the Chinese community's most wealthy and well-known members. 
The Wame Club was one of the oldest and most well-known clubs in Seattle's Chinatown. Willie knew of the club because at one point in his life, he had worked there. He'd seen people who attended and he knew how it operated. It made complete sense to him that he'd use a place he was familiar with. He knew he could make a lot of money in one night. The February morning air was cool that Saturday in 1983. Willie Mack headed to a diner in South Seattle to meet with Benjamin Ng. The two chatted about their plans for the evening. They were excited. Soon, they'd be rich beyond their wildest dreams. They left the diner after breakfast and headed their separate ways, readying themselves for the evening plans. Benjamin headed home. He was living with his girlfriend, Kenneth Izumi, at the time, and the pair had taken a bedroom in Kenneth's parents' home. This meant he had to be careful about meeting with Willie and any other known criminals nearby. For that reason, he'd usually head out into the diners of South Seattle so he could keep some of his criminal life away from his girlfriend's family. The only one of the three not at the diner that morning was Tony. Although he hadn't been at breakfast, He was still very much a part of the plan. He no longer had a choice. And in fact, he had tried to get out of it a few days earlier, but there was no way Willie would have let him. The more Tony learnt about the plan, the less he wanted to be involved. After learning that they were going to rob the Wame, Tony's thoughts shot to his own father, who often spent an evening gambling there. He also worried that the club may be crawling with police, There was a history at the Wame of police spending time there and receiving money and bribes to allow it to continue to operate. All in all, it was too much of a risk for Tony to be involved. He wanted to drop out, so one afternoon, he plucked up the courage to approach Willie and tell him. He borrowed £1,000 from his girlfriend and headed over to pay Willie what he owed. He also secretly decided that he was going to head straight to the police and tell them what Willie had planned for the night of the heist. But Willie wasn't buying it. He knew something was up and he had already told Tony the whole plan. Willie couldn't do it without him and he knew the ins and outs. He knew too much. Willie told Tony he couldn't drop out and then he pulled his gun out and fired it inches away from Tony's left foot. Quote, you know too much already. You got to go. If you tell the police, I'll kill you. If you back out now, I'll shoot you, your family, your girlfriend, and burn down your parents' restaurant. Now go home. I'll pick you up later. If you're not home, I'm going to kill you. That evening, Willie and Tony drove a car they'd borrowed and dropped it off in a parking lot nearby to the club. They planned to use it as the getaway vehicle. The pair headed back to Willie's basement where they met Benjamin and the three of them then started packing up their supplies. Laid out on the pool table in front of them were a number of firearms, some duffel bags and nylon ropes. They were leaving nothing to chance when it came to weaponry. Benjamin had agreed to meet the other two at the club a little later. He was going to stay behind to cut lengths of nylon cord, ready to stuff into a brown paper bag for when they needed to tie people up. Meanwhile, the employees of Wame Club were getting ready for the midnight opening time by setting everything up and making sure all the staff were present and ready for the night ahead. The club itself had two levels with a few steps connecting the upper and lower level inside. Willie and Tony headed straight to the club, which was housed in the ground floor of the four-storey Louisa Hotel. The alley leading to the club was littered with large trash bins and the dust and filth of having never been cleaned. The front doors to the club were uninteresting, almost completely missable. If you didn't know the club was there, you would probably have missed it. The inside was a stark contrast and was home to soft, dim lighting and a number of smartly dressed, well-established members already settling down to begin their evening of gambling. Willie and Tony didn't disguise themselves, They were well-known faces at the club, so when they arrived at the side door of the building, the guard looked through the peephole and just let them straight in. Security was effective, but wasn't too extensive at the club. It consisted of two doorways, 
the first of which was a buzz door, and the second was a manually operated buzz door. Whoever was on security that night would place themselves at the four rows of glass bricks and peer through. If identified as okay to enter, you'd be buzzed into the main area of the club. The security office did have a warning buzzer and a panic button that, if pressed, would set off an alarm. Once you'd been buzzed in, there was a three-foot Buddha on a pedestal right in front of the entrance. It wasn't unusual for members entering the club to rub the Buddha's belly as a charm for good luck before their night of gambling. Tony sat down, trying to hone in on conversations above the loud music playing in the background. He was sitting nervously, occasionally picking at finger food given to him by an older man who made conversation with him. As he sipped his tea, he recognised somebody at the other end of the bar. Wai Yok Chin was a 61-year-old Navy veteran who lived nearby. He had brought with him a plate of takeout Chinese-style spare ribs and potatoes, which he was eating as fuel before he started a shift as a Pai Gao dealer. Willie sat across the room making a mental note of who was there, how many people were sat, who was stood, and where the employees were in comparison to the other members. Just then, the door to the club smacked open and in walked Benjamin Ng. He'd been allowed to come straight in, the security guard had recognised him. He nodded towards Tony before heading further into the club. Without a moment's thought, Benjamin pulled out a gun one described as having a, quote, long barrel and small hole, and shouted for everyone to put their hands up. Willie followed suit and headed straight for the office. He pulled out his gun and pointed it at the security guard. He demanded the guard keep letting customers enter and to act as normally as possible as he buzzed them in. Tony was the last of the three to jump into action. He headed to the bathroom to usher out any customers who had been in there when Benjamin had first pulled out his gun. Once all of the customers were in the main club space, they were ordered to get on the floor. Benjamin pulled open the brown paper bag and threw the nylon cords onto the floor. One by one, the customers' hands were tied behind them, and then their feet. Tony made his way around the group and eventually came to Wai Yok Chin, the older man who he'd spoken to just moments ago. Y glanced backwards as his feet were being tied. He reminded Tony that he was an old man and there was no need to be so tight. Tony heard him. He loosened the ties slightly. All the while, more customers were being buzzed in and were immediately summoned to lie down and have their hands and feet tied up. Willie held the fort, essentially supervising the operation whilst Benjamin and Tony went through all of the customers' pockets. They filled up one of their duffel bags with the money, cash clips and wallets they'd gathered and then ushered the security guard into the centre of the room whilst Tony stood guard. Willie and Benjamin stood on a small set of steps at the top of the gaming area and aimed their guns at the people tied up lying on the floor. One by one, they took aim and shot the helpless customers, making sure to shoot each victim twice, once in the head and once in the neck. Altogether, there were 14 people who had been tied up and 30 shots were fired, not one of them missed. Willie and Benjamin kept shooting until there were no bullets left. The victims who had been murdered that February morning were Chong L. Chin, 52-year-old Mu Min Ma, 47-year-old Jean Ma, 52-year-old Henning Chin, 60-year-old Lung Wing Chin, 60-year-old Hong Fat Gay, 51-year-old Chin Li Law, 51-year-old Dewey Ma, 68-year-old George Ma, 60-year-old Jack Ma, 59-year-old Wing Wong and 54-year-old Gim Lun Wong. After the brutal murder of those people, Willie, Benjamin and Tony made their quick getaway. They fled through the security door 
down the steps and towards their getaway car that they'd parked in the lot just hours earlier. They headed in the direction of the Mercer Island Bridge, and when they arrived, they threw the guns out of the car window. Any evidence that might have connected them to the crime was now gone, and they were confident that they would have no witnesses, so they'd get away scot-free. Meanwhile, back at the club, more members were arriving completely unaware of what lay on the other side of the double security doors. Of course, none of the members were actually able to get in because of the secure entrance. It was usually manned by a security guard who would permit entry within a matter of seconds, so this was unusual. Over the next 30 minutes, more and more members arrived at the entrance to the club. One of the members, George Ong, tried pulling the door open, banging on the windows and standing on a brick to try and peer inside. It was no use. They couldn't see anything and if anyone was on the other side of that door, they would have already come and let them inside. Just as the members were discussing what to do next and whether it would be best just to leave, they heard movement from the other side of the door and moments later, a man came stumbling out. He had severe injuries, bullet wounds in his throat and jaw. It was Wai Yok Chin, the man who had earlier asked Tony to loosen his restraints. Wai had been shot, along with the other 13 victims, but he had slightly preempted the shooting, allowing himself to move minutely towards and underneath one of the gaming tables. This meant that when he was ultimately shot, the bullets did hit him but in an incredibly lucky turn of events, he was only wounded and not killed. Then, when he'd heard the loud banging coming from the members outside, trying to figure out what was going on, he'd managed to loosen his restraints fully and crawl away from the dead bodies. He was still seeping blood, but he managed to pull himself up towards the security door. He pushed it open and fell forwards to where the other members were outside. At this point, Why didn't know if he was going to make it. George tried to get out of him what had happened, and Why knew that the people responsible needed to be caught and brought to justice, even if that was the last thing he said. And with that, he managed to splutter out the names of Willie Mack and Benjamin Ng. He did say there was a third man there, but he didn't know his name, and he didn't recognise him. Just a few streets away, A police officer was doing a patrol of that area of Chinatown. His car police radio crackled that the news of a 911 call had come in to report a bloody man down in Maynard Alley South. The officer was just metres away and rushed towards the scene. Once there, he ran into two more officers who had just arrived moments earlier. They helped Wai Yok Chin into the front of the police car and asked him question after question, desperately trying to gain more information about what had happened. An ambulance arrived soon after and took Wai away to Harborview Medical Center, where it was quickly determined Wai's injuries were severe and he was in a critical condition. Because he had managed to give the name of Willie Mack and Benjamin Ng, and the two of them were known and feared local Tong members, Wai was placed under round-the-clock police protection. By the time Wai had been taken to hospital, more police officers had arrived and readied themselves to enter what they could only assume to be a horrific scene. What they discovered on entering, however, was far worse than they had ever imagined. Because of the security measures in place, there was no easy way to open the front doors of the club. Instead, officers called in help from the local fire department They used a steel bar to force open the doors and let themselves inside. The view they were met with was one full of red spatter down the hallway, droplets of blood pooling and partially drying, and further into the main rooms of the club were piles of bodies. The sight was like nothing they'd ever seen before. Over a dozen victims, all hogtied with their wrists and ankles tied behind them. The amount of blood that was visible was unlike anything any of the officers had seen before. So much so, the officers who made their way into the main room 
placed plastic bags over their shoes. They were afraid that without some form of protection, they may slip and fall. At this point, the officers investigating the scene didn't know who was involved and if the suspects may still be inside. So they took their time to clear the main room and the smaller rooms attached. And then they heard a short, sharp wheezing, almost too quietly to properly identify where it was coming from. One of the officers told the room, now flurrying with other officers and paramedics, to be quiet so they could identify the source of the noise. The wheezing continued and the officer followed the sound before finding a man tied by the hands and feet, laying face down, shot and bleeding, but alive. The officer called for help and the man, identified as John Liu, was rushed out of the club and into the ambulance, waiting outside. He was also rushed to Harborview Medical Center and taken straight into surgery. But unfortunately, John's injuries were so severe that he died on the operating table. Outside the club, the alley was cordoned off with a number of officers standing guard. They knew the nature of this kind of attack meant that it was likely connected in some way to one of the tongs situated in the local area. News of the massacre travelled fast and within an hour of Wise's escape, a crowd of over 60 had gathered around, waiting to find out what exactly had happened and who was involved. The investigation that followed happened quickly. After the initial identification that Y had made, a number of officers made their way to the only known home associated with Willie Mack. They arrived at the front door and knocked. It wasn't long before they heard the rustling of keys, the familiar sound of unlocking, and then the door swung open. On the other side of the door was a man a similar age and build to Willie, but it wasn't him. He identified himself as Willie's brother. One of the officers told Willie's brother about what had happened, the robbery, the multiple homicides, and impressed on him the importance of finding Willie quickly. The younger man was then joined by his father, who opened the door further and invited them inside. They asked if Willie Mack was at the property, or if they knew where Benjamin Ng might be. Willie's brother responded that he knew Benjamin wasn't around, but Willie might be in his room. He pointed out Willie's bedroom and both officers proceeded to the door. They opened the door quickly and went straight over to the bed, which was at the side of the room. They saw a lump underneath the bed covers, but on pulling them back, realised it was just how it had been left and Willie was nowhere to be seen. They did, however, notice a holstered handgun in the corner of the room and around $5,000 worth of cash, equivalent to around $14,000 in today's money. Although the home visit hadn't been a success in terms of capturing Willie, the investigation progressed quickly and it wasn't long before they found him in one of his usual Tong hideouts and arrested him. He quickly gave up Benjamin Ng's home address. The officer went to that address, which belonged to Benjamin's brother, Stephen. He informed officers that Benjamin was living at his girlfriend's parents' house. He gave them the address and they went straight there. It was approximately 6.30am when the officers arrived at Kenneth's parents' home. One officer knocked on the front door and Kenneth's mother answered. The officer identified himself and explained that Benjamin was a suspect in multiple homicides that had happened just hours earlier. Kenneth's mother let them inside and escorted them to her daughter's bedroom where she knew Benjamin would be sleeping. The two officers made their way into the bedroom where they noticed two guns lying next to two stacks of money. They also found Benjamin, fast asleep, totally unaware of the officer's presence. They woke him up and immediately arrested him. They also asked if they could search the bedroom, but Benjamin refused, saying they'd need a warrant if they wanted to do that. They proceeded to take Benjamin out of the house and into the police station. Whilst he was being escorted out, one officer stood guard at the bedroom so that they could wait for another officer to arrive with a warrant. They were well aware of Benjamin's Tong connections and were wary of anyone else entering the bedroom and potentially disrupting or moving evidence. It took a few hours for all the necessary documentation to be produced. 
but at around 2pm, the police returned with the warrant and went on to search the bedroom Benjamin had been living out of. Altogether, they managed to seize around $7,500 in cash, which would be over $24,000 in today's money. They also seized two loaded 38 caliber revolvers, an M1 rifle, and a huge amount of ammunition. Once in custody, both Willie and Benjamin denied they had anything to do with the murders. They admitted to being at the Wa Mei, but said they were only there to beat up a rival Chinatown Tong member, and they'd never planned to rob the place. In fact, he said they'd been long gone from the club by the time the killings had taken place. Their story was questionable and quickly determined to be false. Not only did the timelines not match up, but Wai Yok Chin had named both men the moment he ran into George outside the Wa Mei. Unfortunately, although the believed ringleader Willie and his known accomplice Benjamin had been arrested, the third man, Tony Ng, had not been found. Despite a thorough search of the areas surrounding Chinatown and extensive questioning of both Willie and Benjamin, the police had no luck. There was a worry that he may have fled the country by this point. Investigators set up a Chinese variety language answering service. They said, quote, Your friends were killed. Help us to catch the persons responsible. Willie and Benjamin were formally charged with 13 counts of aggravated first-degree murder and one count of first-degree assault. I'm not sure why that first-degree assault charge wasn't attempted murder, given that Wai Yok Chin had almost been killed and that was the intention. Um, I do know that the difference between attempted murder and aggravated assault is usually to do with intent. But we do know that Willie and Benjamin tried to make why succumb to the same end as those other 13 victims. So I can't quite understand that decision, but either way, they were the charges. And the prosecutor made clear his intent to seek the death penalty against both men. Tony Ng, meanwhile, had been working in a factory and living under an assumed name, Jim Wong. He'd left Seattle soon after the murders and had been living in an apartment in Chinatown in Calgary, Alberta, in Canada ever since. It was a little under two years after the massacre that Tony was discovered and arrested, after an anonymous tip named Tony as living in Calgary. The RCMP and the FBI had worked together to ensure his capture and subsequent extradition back to Seattle. Tony admitted to being at the Wame Club on the night of the massacre, but said that he was told to wait in the section of the club between the two security doors. He added that he had heard the shots but hadn't seen anything. He also said that for his part in the robbery, Willie and Benjamin had given him $6,000 and his $1,000 debt with Willie had been struck off. He also told the court that he had tried to back out of the robbery before that evening, but that Willie wouldn't let him and threatened to kill his family if he backed out. At the time, Benjamin Ng was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole and Willie Mack was sentenced to the death penalty. Even though both Willie and Benjamin were convicted of the same crimes, the reason that Willie was given the more severe sentence was because of two reasons as given by the court. The first was that Willie was characterised as the orchestrator of that crime and the second that the personal difference between the two men justified the different outcomes. However, eight years after that initial conviction, Willie's death sentence was overturned by the state Supreme Court because of his lawyer's failure to submit evidence that may have proved a different outcome. Willie was resentenced, and this time to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Meanwhile, in 1985, after Tony's extradition back to Seattle, He was found guilty of robbery and assault, but not murder. For this, he was sentenced to 30 years to life in prison. Wai Yon Chin bravely testified at all three trials. Tony Ng was denied parole five times during his prison time, but after 30 years in 2014, he was released and deported to Hong Kong. The decision was made by the state's Indeterminate Sentence Review Board, 
Quote, It was a tough decision, especially because of the nature of the crime. But I think the board ultimately has to look at what our statutory responsibility is. If we only looked at the crime itself, we wouldn't release anybody. The board found that Tony was fully rehabilitated and fit for release, although many family members of the victims were horrified by this decision. Hazel Chin, a daughter of one of the victims, said, quote, Everyone is given the opportunity to make choices, and Tony Ng made the wrong choice. I will never be at peace knowing Tony Ng is back on the streets. The man who had died on the operating table, John, had a son, Jason, who was a sophomore at the time of the shooting. He said that he went from a carefree, young man, a teenager, straight to being the man of the house. All he could do was attempt to survive. He wasn't living life like someone his age should have been. The responsibility and the pain was unbearable. Chong Chin, one of the victims of the massacre, had come to America when he was just 16 years old. He was an extremely hard worker, starting his career as a dishwasher and quickly progressing to becoming a cook. He was a keen learner and had dreamt of becoming a restaurant owner himself. Chong's gambling habits were his way of blowing off steam, and for him it was just a hobby, but it did give him the chance to achieve, quote, material things, his piece of the American pie, his chance to relax after a day at the hot stove. Chong's son Larry spoke of the missed opportunity for his father to meet his three grandchildren. Quote, I often fantasise on holidays, special events, what it would be like if he was with us. Larry had been so haunted by the thought of the massacre and what his father went through that night that he's only visited Seattle, the place he grew up, three times since Chong's death. The Wame Club didn't ever reopen its doors. In fact, it lay locked up and abandoned, the once deep green outer shell covered in a thick layer of muck and dust. It stayed that way for many years, up until Christmas Eve 2013, when it was engulfed by a fire. The building's roof and floors below caved inwards and it was quickly deemed unsafe. No one was harmed, but the owner then decided to demolish the building and make way for a new investment, what turned out to be 84 affordable apartments up for rent. After the trials, Wai Yok Chin and his girlfriend Rose had been living in hiding in an apartment above Pike Place Market. Due to the fact that William Mack had been known Tong members, and the fact that the initial couple of years after the massacre, Tony Ng was on the run, Wai and Rose were living under heavy police protection. The couple would spend their days inside, often inviting the officers tasked with protecting them inside to play cards. They grew friendly with the officers, and the team would take both Wai and Rose out for day trips, often visiting Kamano Island State Park, a local zoo, Long Acres Racetrack and many more. Although the day-to-day and trips out tended to be a relaxing break on the surface, it wasn't without intense awareness from the officers on duty. They would make sure to always travel in unmarked cars and usually headed out of Seattle City so there was very little chance of being recognised. Wai Yok Chin passed away in 1994, 10 years after the attacks, at the age of 72.